So just to let everybody know, this is part of the Mindful Social Podcast. You'll be able to see it on my YouTube channel. You'll see it on my channel on Spreaker. And you can also find it on the website at mindfulsocial.com, mindfulsocialmarketing.com. And my guest this week is Adam Helway, one of my really bestest buddies and somebody that I've done a lot of podcasting with over the last few years. And, uh, you know, we got to talking about working with clients and the relationships that we have with clients and how, you know, when you're a solopreneur or an entrepreneur with a small business, sometimes you find yourself chasing business because you're afraid the next job isn't going to come. You don't know what's going to happen. And sometimes you take clients that you're just not really that excited to be working with. So we want to talk today about client relationships and how taking a mindful approach to how you manage your clients, how you manage your business can really help you grow. And before we get into that topic, I would love you, Adam, to introduce yourself for the very few people who don't know who you are. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, as you said, I'm Adam Helway, and um, uh, just almost 10 years ago, in October will be 10 years, I keep, I'm, I'm happy with that round number, I keep thinking about it, uh, I founded a small uh, boutique agency called Secret Sushi Creative. We've shortened it to Secret Sushi Inc. Um, and uh, back then, when I first started, my biggest passion, which is still a big passion of mine, but it sort of evolved into uh, into sort of bleeding into other areas, was um, design. So we were a creative services company. And then uh, over the years, um, I kept my eyeball on sort of, um, you know, tackling things that were were sort of considered less a commodity and uh, and and were was sort of the leading edge of what people found value in with their businesses which was uh, which was was marketing and predominantly digital marketing and social media marketing and that sort of thing so for a number of years uh, we've we've been focusing on that for almost more now than um, than on the design side so I, I think uh, so basically secret sushi is a strategic design and digital marketing agency out here in the Silicon Valley. In a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell. In a nutshell. So when we started talking about client relationships, you know, I think over the years, you know, we've both seen at least one dot com boom um, and crash and market crash. And it's really common for entrepreneurs to, you know, kind of jump at every opportunity, at least the inexperienced ones. And as we've gained more experience, we've kind of learned some better ways, you know, to judge which clients are going to be a good fit for us. So can you you speak to that just a little bit about, you know, how you go through looking at a client um, when you get a new opportunity and evaluating whether, you know, this is going to be a good fit for you or not? Yeah. So I think folks, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that folks go through a few different phases, right? When they first start their company or they first start consulting or whichever shape or form um, their business is, um, you have a tendency to really need business initially. And therefore, sometimes you're, you're darn near willing to take anything so that you can end up paying the, the bills. So you're really not saying no to much unless it's completely outside what you feel um you're capable of, of of delivering, and even in some cases, folks uh, end up accepting that, which sort of puts them in a pickle um, when they get down and dirty with things. But I think over time, you end up evolving. Um, you know, so you start getting a few customers. So so from there, you're you're working on what you're doing for your customers, and what happens is is you go from this. Um, this sort of almost sales mode that you're in initially to like meet people and, and, and connect and spend time outside of your office getting business to suddenly having to balance the habit of doing that along with, oh, well, well I have to actually sit down now and, and finish this work that somebody has. And so initially it can be a bit stressful trying to balance those two things out because like you said, you know, your, your, your brain is not there. Your brain is thinking like, well, what's the future of the company in? And uh, I've been going two or three or four months or more with less work than, you know, less paid work than I have to pay the bills. Um, I, I still need to get out there and, and sort of pound the pavement. 
Um, and, and I went through those phases. I definitely went through those phases where, you know, a chunk of my time was spent, you know, making connections at uh, chambers of commerce events or, or conferences or uh, uh, wh whatever shape or form I could. And then eventually it was like, well, I don't have to do that that much. I had a, I had a few years ago, especially where we ended up shifting a, a pretty decent chunk of our of our client work from project based stuff uh, in, in, to a lot more retainer based work. Um, and it wasn't that we didn't have that opportunity before. It was just not something I really focused on very much. And that completely changed the game to the point where as of January, I didn't really have to let my mind wander and start getting into that sales mode for the full year because I already knew what I could do at this at this time. And I really needed to shift now from selling to how do I make sure that my current clients are awesome? You know, like like to feel feel good about the work that we're doing and that we're rocking for them because it's always much easier to keep the clients that you have and even get more work from those clients and get referrals from those clients than it is to go out there blindly looking for for brand new connections that uh, and and work and customers. Um, so I, I think there's that 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 next phase after you're sort of just oh my gosh I'm so hungry for anything to hey I've got in a good groove and these clients work and I really need to stop and focus on just really making um, this work that we're doing for this these clients rock and shine and 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 make them happy because after all that's what you're in business for not to collect clients like pokemon your <laughs> your your job is is to get you know the is to get some clients and to do an awesome job with them and build a build a business from it right yeah and i think that's i think that's really fascinating how you kind of go through that transition of you know, you're going to the networking meetings and you're passing out the business cards and you're going to the chamber of commerce and you're, you're working so hard to sell that you're not really investing a lot of time in the clients that you, you have. Um, and does, is that kind of how that led to you to having more long-term relationships with your clients and, and that kind of a, um, a regular commitment to them? Uh, you know, I always had that commitment to them because I love the relationship part, whether it's a client or otherwise. And for me, part of doing business was was really how do I help empower my customers to to connect with their audiences? My customers, I look at my customers as people, um, the customers at least I choose to 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 have now versus just simply anybody as being people worthy of of having their product or service discovered and known about for the customers they're trying to connect to. And so I look at it as my job is part of my mission is to find, you know, there's customers that have relevant needs and there's meaning. So my customers have, have a product or service to provide. And there's people out there that have relevant needs for those products or services from my customers. And so th there's a slight tinge of altruisticness, you know, blended, blended in there. Um, but I think what it was is it was the difference between me just sort of running myself into the ground physically and mentally and emotionally to overextend myself as a human being because I was juggling those things. So rather than maybe giving my clients less, which I could say that I, I have become more mindful about how to make sure I'm giving them you know, sort of more, but you have to give and take from some places. You you you, you can't be a hundred percent present a hundred percent of the time on a hundred percent of the things that are going on around you. Right. Um, so I think at that moment it was about realizing that I couldn't be one hundred percent on the sales side or one hundred percent on even, for instance, taking care of all the work because I know how to do just about anything we do at the company, but. But doing it all myself is not the best way of, of doing things. It's not realistic. Mm -hmm. It's not the best route. And, and ultimately, it isn't uh, beneficial to, to the companies. It's actually more beneficial for the companies to have a certain portion of who I am from a leadership standpoint for of the company and strategic standpoint. And for, you know, that's why they say, find people that are better than you at doing X, Y, and Z at your company. Those folks can be 
mindfully present within that particular thing that you need them to do. So they're not actually um, sort of enveloped and, and, and distracted by all the other stuff going on. And as as the you know person running the company and, and interfacing with the clients, I need to be in that same position so that I can give the best of what uh, you know comes from me. And I'm not really always great with that. I've gotten better at it. I know we've got Steve, for Nobody's instance, here perfect. in chat. Yeah, I know we've got Steve here in chat, and Steve and I have mm-hmm. had a lot of discussions with that. You and I have had a lot of discussions, and um, I, I think that's part of it is also always being hard on yourself if you're like, look, I got to do better, and I have to do better, and. And sure, we, we, we need, we, it's great to improve. It's great to work on ourselves, but there comes a moment when there's people that depend on us in this, in this case, particularly our clients, where we have to just sort of pause for a second and say, at this moment, this is what I need to focus on. There's people in companies that, that need me to take care of this thing right at this, at this moment. And, and, and they like the work that we do. Mm Mm-hmm which can easily turn into they like the work that we do, but we're not doing the work for them so that we lose that clan, you know? Um, So there's just far too much at stake when other things distract, uh, distract you. Right. So kind of what I hear you're saying um, is that delegation and finding people who can do particular tasks and take that off your plate and you know that it's well cared for and that they're very focused on what they're doing and they're good at what they're doing, frees you up as the owner of the company to be able to engage with your clients better and be more mindful to what their needs are and pay a little more attention to um, maybe more creative ways to get them what they need. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, early on, it's, you know, the people describe it as as feast or famine, right? Where you've got spikes in work and then suddenly you're like, oh, well, I don't. I've been blessed enough that always things have sort of progressed in the in, in the way of of fruitfulness, of of more work and, and, and so on. But what happens is early on, you're so focused on making sure that you pay your bills and making sure you've got a little fund in the in, in, in cash flow in the bank. That when it comes to delegating things that you're like, well, I could just take care of that myself. Like when it, you know, you end up thinking, well, why would I give a portion of this billable money away? And then realizing like, that's the way that you actually grow the business and you, and you do more, Um, you know, you ultimately it's about the long term. It's about the long-term relationship with the client. It's about the long-term life of, that company. And um, sometimes if you get caught up, I mean, that's sort of almost the flip side in some cases where at the moment a client needs you to work on that work right then and there. But there are some cases where you really have to examine what you're doing right at that moment and decide, for instance, whether it's better to like give up on a client or to break a relationship with a client that's really sort of, you know, uh, uh, poisonous for, for, for some, for some reason, or to make some other decision that actually is more about being present in the future of your company rather than, um, right at that moment, because you're just going to kind of keep dragging yourself through uh, a level of misery. That's going to have an impact, not only on your business, but ultimately actually on your other customers as well. You know, if you got one customer that ends up dragging, your time and eating a lot of your time where you've got three customers that are very respectful of your time and, and uh, uh, don't ask more than what they've paid for and that sort of thing. Ultimately, ultimately the other cu- customer is much more expensive, both financially uh, and uh, mentally and, and physically and all that, that, that sort of thing. And it's not just you that ends up paying for it with your time. It actually is all the clients, that you, that you could be serving with that time and your own company. Mm -hmm. That comes right to a question that I think both Steve and Karen have had in the chat about how do you decide, you know, when clients are really, when spending a lot of time on a client is really worthwhile for both you and the client. And, you know, if, if the relationship just isn't working and you're getting one of those clients that is toxic, to your success and maybe even to their own success, what do you do about it? How do you make those decisions? 
So, you know, I mean, I think at, at all times, having an honest, for me, I don't pick clients unless I know that I can have a honest conversation with them, mm-hmm. period. Sure. Um, if I can't have an honest conversation with you, if I feel like I'm going to get kicked around by the client because the client feels that everything is completely, you know, like they know better on all these things they've hired me for, then they don't need me, really. They don't need me. I, I want to work with a client that in the same way that I have personal relationships, my professional relationships are, it, this is a two-way conversation. This is this is me and you bringing our best ideas to the table um, coming at things from our own personal and professional experiences and coming up with the best, you know, the best idea. And I want to respect you as the client. And I want you to respect me as, as the person that you've hired to help out with this. If you need, I've made a, I made a conscious decision early on to not position me or the company as, um, as one which, could do work that monkeys on a keyboard could take care of. Mm-hmm. Okay. You need somebody that's just going to just, you know, bang away at something. Don't hire me. That's not what I'm here for. You're not monkeys. Uh, you know, <laughs> one of the things, yeah, we're not monkeys, you know? Uh, uh, and so one of the, one of the things I've sort of got behind in the last year or so is, you know, you want to, you want to hire us cause you don't want to, you don't just want a company that w- works with you. You want a company that thinks with you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and that means there has to be a certain level of, of respect. Um, and respect doesn't, doesn't, um, it's not a diva thing at all. It's just about, you know, being a human being to each other. And there's a lot of toxic, toxic, toxicness that goes on in, in, in uh, corporations and other companies where people are butting heads and fighting about things and all that. And you know what? They can keep that stuff to themselves. Uh, I'm not interested in working with companies like that. So making a conscious decision, whenever I have a conversation with somebody, I'm usually feeling them out to see, are we going to connect? Are, is this person flexible in any way? Be, you know, They're likely, for instance, taking on somebody to help with digital marketing because it's out of their realm or they don't quite understand those things. So if I've got to come and help them buy in on new concepts, then a certain level of, of flexibility and, and, and sort of understanding um, and just plain listening, it doesn't mean they got to listen to everything I say a hundred percent without challenge. That's not, that's not how I see it. Um, but if, if those things are present, then we will have a great relationship. And if I don't see those things present when we're st- when we're initially talking, then I know that there's going to be a, a really big drag um, mm-hmm. on on everything that's going on between that cu- customer themselves and and all the rest of the folks. And so I know, like for instance, Steve, and probably you can attest to conversations we've had about you know I, I do have you know I've got a customer or two that that um, takes more effort and and time. Um, and, or at certain points, I probably, as much as I sort of say this, I do have a bigger, um, tolerance for patience and things than, than some other people. Your business masochist. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) exactly. And so, you know, I have a bit bigger tolerance for it and I put up with it. And, and, and part of that in me is the sort of, Look, if I can if I can tackle these tougher challenges, then 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 I'll I'll learn from them and I'll be able to apply them to mm-hmm. create better relationships in the future. So I, I look at that as a long term goal from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Now, Karen asked a great question in the chat about you know how do you if you have a written strategy, is that going to help you work through this? Is that part of your process when you first start talking to a client to say okay? We're going to line out exactly what we're going to do here and what the deliverables are on both sides, not just on your side, but also on the client's side. Does that help? Uh, sometimes, most of the time. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, sometimes having uh, sometimes the project doesn't necessarily entail that and sometimes it does. So, you know, having that does uh, does help and, and uh, does help a lot and makes sense. Uh, especially when needing to cover your butt, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, when keeping people on uh, on track. So I, I think it does in some instances. In some instances, it doesn't. I think it helps to set expectations too, you know, because I think a lot of clients um, at certain levels, 
especially clients that are small businesses. Maybe they're just getting into social. They're just getting into dig digital marketing. It's all scary and new and they have no idea what to ask. So setting those expectations for them and okay, this is what we're going to do and no, you're not going to get 20,000 followers on your Facebook page in a week. So, you know, those kind of things help a lot. Um, I don't always write that into the contract, but I think setting those very clear expectations can help people um, not be quite so toxic because you've been very clear about what the expectations are. And, you know, that, that helps you both to fall back and go, look, you know, we set this up and this is what we said we were going to do. And, you know, here's what the process was. Um, but it can be very challenging uh, even then because some people don't know how to interpret the contract either. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I, I think to me, what I have found most useful is, is in establishing a human tone and human relationship with, with folks. And what I mean by that is, um, it, it, it's the way that I am, but I found that it's something people enjoy and they like is that, you know, I spend a great deal of time listening and then, and then actually reflecting back on uh, like I've got clients a lot that say, but yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know the terms for this, or I'm sorry that I don't know much about this or whatever. And you know what? Those are vulnerable moments for them that can sometimes be taken advantage of by other folks in our industry or other industries, whoever it is that they're trying to hire for whatever job. Mm -hmm. And so I think never talking, never never sort of taking advantage of that to position yourself above the client okay your job is is to is to bring down those walls and to get them to understand that you know you're not here to be that gatekeeper of all the jargon and all this stuff that you're going to throw at them in order to show them how much that you know that your job really is to build confidence with them uh, when you have those conversations and to allow for those those vulnerable moments to happen where you can, you can be vulnerable as well to show them like, look, we're, we're in this together. We're, mm -hmm. we're on the same, we're on the same team. As soon as you start to change it to, you know, we're not on the same team that it's me against you in some fashion or form. And, you know, I've had that happen a few times with a couple clients where um, I really wanted to just kind of put my foot down. Mm-hmm. And I think and, they were working with the same client when that happened. Actually. Yeah. And, and, you know, <laughs> the, and, and sometimes it's, it, it, it's okay to put your foot down in a, there's, there's a, there's a difference between being assertive or being uh, authoritative mm -hmm. and just being a jerk or a diva or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and I've had friends that have, that have talked me down from ledges sometimes when I'm like, uh, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to, I'm going to put it out there that, you know, you guys really don't know how to communicate and we need to work on that stuff or, or if we don't fix it, something else is going to happen or whatever, because us ourselves can also be sort of taken over by stress. It could be yeah. something else. It could be not even that yeah, client, that man you know? right? <laughs> and, and so it, it, it's, we also have to be present and go, okay. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves is going to a business or talking to somebody at a business and that person not looking like they give a damn about being there or mm -hmm. doing whatever they're doing. You go to get food and the waiter doesn't look like they're having a good day or, or you're working with somebody and they, the person is not happy to me, that person is not present. What they're doing is, is they're too busy dealing with their baggage and, and running on autopilot once they end up getting into the business and going, well, I'm supposed to be here from nine to five. So I'm just going to do what I need to do from nine to five. And they don't realize that part of that is, is, is being mindful about what they're doing at that moment and not allowing the other garbage to bleed into into that interaction that they're having with you. And so that's a big pet peeve of mine. And, and, I try to do the same thing in my business or when I'm talking with somebody, no matter what's going on in my day, um, the client doesn't really know about it. They, they, they don't need to know about it. In most cases, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to them. Uh, I'm great. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky to have relationships with clients where 
we do have personal conversations sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. we, we, again, we're humans, so it's, it's okay. So we have personal conversations. So if something happens in their life or my life, sometimes gets brought up or whatever. And, but the, the thing is, is, you know, it's, it's business. We need to move on. Somebody's entire business should not have to stop because something's going on with, with me, you know, mm-hmm. or, or with, with somebody else at the company or whatever like that. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think there's also that disconnect, you know, sometimes you'll go into a, a meeting and know as soon as you sit down, okay, this is not going to work. And I was listening to Gary V's new book, um, ask Gary V and in it, he was saying that he's gone into meetings where he would sit down and start his presentation and 10 minutes, you know, he's a 45 minute presentation, 10 minutes into it, he'd realize that they were just expecting him to come in and push the buttons and make miracles happen. And, you know, unicorn poop. And he would just close up his presentation, end it and leave early and get that 40 minutes back, you know? And I'm like, wow, bravo, you know? And okay, Gary V can probably do that a lot more often than I can, but still it's really important that we keep that into perspective that there are clients that you should just walk away from because they're not ready or they're not vested in their own success. They just expect you to hand it to them. And that's not actually possible. If there isn't a relationship between you and the client so that you can actually have conversations about what they're gonna do, what the value is, how things are gonna work, whether it needs to be retooled because it constantly needs to be retooled. So all of those things coming together have to work. And if you can't have those real personal conversations and you don't feel that they're mindful about their own business, how can you be mindful about their business? Yeah. Especially when, you know, sort of uh, some clients don't have a realistic expectation of timing or how quickly something gets done. And I'll say that I'm a person that really sort of hustles on, on, on things. I don't drag things out. And in fact, I'm surprised sometimes when I, when I did move for a short period of time, way, way back in the day from, um, uh, a small uh, independent company to uh, a corporation and saw how freaking slow the corporations were at getting things done when, you know, in a small and small and medium sized businesses, you know, it's, it's, it's people wear more, more, more hats and, and mm-hmm. there's more to do and things, there's a, more, you know, greater sense of urgency. Um, and so I, I think, being everybody always and then from that perspective those folks even though they're working really slow um they expect a certain you know hurry up and wait and then suddenly oh we gotta 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 work on it really really fast i I had a call today from one of my favorite clients and they were like oh you know with for our, our ceo wants to see some things you know launched by the end of the day here and i was like okay well let's have an honest conversation about that you know like there's things that have to be done and one of the one of the one of the quotes, and I don't remember exactly what it what it was, but it was like you know somebody said if if I don't know if it was George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or 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 uh, you know one of those guys, um, but it was something in regards to if I had five hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first three hours sharpening my my axe, mm-hmm. and and that that it, that for us is we something we we have to be mindful of is we have to be mindful and say like there's actual work that ha- that that has that that has to happen ahead of time before the work actually goes full steam ahead that will make everything run smoother that will make the work get completed faster but the perception of being busy the perception of momentum is what the client might be looking for at that moment. And you can't get caught up in that perception. That perception just ends up rolling downhill to you as a, as a vendor consultant, and you end up having to cover that gap, right? You're, you're the one that's got to be busy, not the, not the client, the client's coming. Unless they don't have the deliverables and then you can't do anything. Yeah. And they don't have the components that you need to move the thing forward. You know, but they expect it done today, but they're going to get that to you at like noon. <laughs> you know, I, I run into that a lot. Um, and that, yeah. I think that's the, that's the other thing is that there is that give and take in the conversation you were talking about where you have to be able to have a conversation with them about, OK, if you want that, this has to happen. This has to happen. This is what I have to do. 
And is that really what you want to happen right now? Um, you know, and how are we going to do it in the future so that we get that a little more in advance? Because you can't always have it that way. You know, the, you, you don't want a client that keeps saying jump and you go how high. And in some cases, they're asking you to jump as part of things that are not really things you've discussed or part of your responsibility. So what you do is you start to set this, the tone for I'm, you know, you're the client, just ask and I'll do whatever it is. And then again, in that case, what you start doing is you start doing more work than than you've initially thought that you had to do. And it ends mm -hmm. up uh, making the initial work that you agreed to do um, take longer or, or or whatever, you know, so you, you have everything is a, is a give and a take and ends up um, impacting what you're doing either internally as as a human being from you know your your mental state to the other clients that you have at your business and then ultimately even the work that you do for that client if that client is going to be disappointed with you because you can't deliver on the one thing that they asked you to do that wasn't actually part of your responsibility uh then then you're going to lose that client in the long term mm -hmm. so you need to set and and if that client can't accept when you talk to them about that and say, you know, that wasn't part of our contract. Let's focus on, 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 you know, can, can we focus on this or is that something else you need us to take a look at? Um, I didn't go do a good job of challenging clients in the past. I did whatever in many cases, almost anything that they, that they asked as part of a way to be the, the be, the, be that team. Um, and that's changed. It's it's had to change in order to keep the momentum going for the company and in order to be successful for all the clients that we're that we're working with. Well, and I think clients need to understand how much collaboration there is required, especially in this business, which changes so quickly. Um, and I think, you know, they expect us to have a lot of skills that are always ahead of the curve. And, you know, that speaks to a question that Steve had about how do you keep those skills sharp? And for my part of that same question, how do you find the time to stay ahead of the clients and what's going on in the market? How do you, you know, do you chunk time for that? How do you continuously educate yourself in what's new and what's hot and what's going to work for your clients specifically? Um. You know, I'm just passionate about it. So for for me, for me, you know, like when the day's done, I, I'm still reading a lot, or I'm still you know listening to things a lot, or whatever. And so for 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 some folks, you know, they like reality TV. Some folks like documentaries. Some folks like history. I, I like I like TV shows. I like geek stuff, all that sort of thing. But I also lo love reading a, a new study or a blog post or an ebook or something on the topic. It's just something that I'm, I'm passionate about. Um, I'm also sort of obsessively and potentially overly obsessive when it comes <laughs> to trying to improve what, what we do as a company. I have a certain goal of what I want myself for, of myself and, and of, of the company in the long run and um, I think what I have to do is 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 constantly be reminded, and I'm reminded by seeing a lot of great folks like yourself and and others where we have these conversations, and you see folks um, who tell the tale of gradually growing their company, or saying that they've had a company for X amount of years, or that it took X amount of years before they ended up, you know, sort of like getting this particular speaking gig, which put you know push things over the top, and mm -hmm. so being reminded of those things allows me to still sort of do the sharpening of my saw and learning, but then not, not blow my whole time, you know, blow all my free time in doing so. Um, because I know that I still need to loop back and I need to take care of the day to day at the business that, you know, mm -hmm. the company is going to the company is almost 10 years old. And there's a lot of folks out there that it wasn't until say their seventh year or 10th year or 12th year where they they really turned uh, uh, um, the, the corner in a way that I'm hoping, you know, that the company continues to, to go in the direction that my companies that I'd like my company continue to go. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so again, I, I think in sharpening, um, to stay ahead of the clients is, is really also about making sure that part of your ongoing time, there's time that to think about how to improve those relationships. Mm-hmm. So at any given week, at any given week, you have, you know, a half hour, an hour or whatever to not just address the work the clients need, but what's going on in that relationship and how can you how can you improve it? If there's something going on with the way the client communicates to you, is there a way to address that respectfully to the client so that you can bring it up to them and 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 communicate that it's of their benefit and your benefit to find a way to focus on um, how to communicate differently or better or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so about making those things active parts of your conversation, um, client management, uh, that was one of the things that we really didn't call out. It was just a natural organic thing that we did. But but now we're a little bit we treat it a little bit differently uh, as sort of a separate entity. But client management and client um, account management, those things are part of what clients pay for. Mm -hmm. They don't say they do. Right. They don't put it down on some do a couple of them do big, big clients, really big clients will sometimes call that stuff out. But in general, it's expected that it's part of the, the service. The service. Mm-hmm. And so, so it's something that all businesses really need to think about, like, how are we going to manage this client? You know, that part of their, what they're paying for and part of their, uh, their happiness is not just derived from the quality of the work, but it's from the quality of the human interaction that they have with you and how you treat them. And so by putting some energy on that, on a frequent basis for all your clients, it actually pays in dividends. Mm, absolutely. I agree a hundred percent on that. So Karen asked a question that I think is a good follow-up to this is, are you then finding part of your role is to educate the clients and let them know, okay, there's a new opportunity for us to, to market your product here, or, you know, is there a new tool or a new platform that we could be using to, um, you know, better market your product. Um, how much client education do you feel like you do as part of those conversations you have? Well, let me first say that um, I'm finding that when I ask customers or I have conversations with customers that being that evangelist or being that person, keeping my finger on the heartbeat of those things and, and sharing opportunities is one of the biggest reasons why they continue to want to work with me in particular, Mm -hmm. Um, that they, they want somebody again, like I said, somebody who thinks with them and not just works with them. I've had, I think two clients this year, two of my, uh, of my ongoing clients tell me, you know, we rely on you to see ahead and let us know what we should be, what we should be doing. I love that. I enjoy that because I like to be in that place. I like to be, 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 uh, you know, sort of aware of what's, what's going on. And we did that with our previous podcast. You and I talk about that stuff a lot. I know you yourself are very much like that as well, Janet. And so, you know, for me to, to, for there to be a value to my customers that I happen to be sort of geeky and, and really, you know, passionate and paying attention to these things, um, is, is awesome. And, And so there are some clients that want that so much that it it definitely becomes a part of it. Um, When it comes to sort of client education, I I say that it normally doesn't come off as being sort of education as much as sort of like anticipating their needs and then sharing with them opportunities. I think it's, Mm -hmm. it's about identifying opportunities and then for them for them to say, okay, well, I don't get it. What, do, what, what should I do with Blab? I, I see that I can. I see that there's been some changes on Facebook. What does that What does that mean for me? How should we do this? Um, we've got live video that we can do on Facebook or on Periscope or whatever. Is this something I should pay attention to? And sometimes they they, they find relief in me saying, "Don't bother. It's not a good mm-hmm. fit for you." You know, because they need somebody that tells them they've been told by everybody. And I, and I did this uh, with the digital marketing training, as I said, um, 
you know, two things that are sort of poison for, for companies these days or, or, or something that really gets in the way is the statement of, wouldn't it be cool if, mm-hmm. and the other is, you should dot, dot, dot. <laughs> like you should be on Facebook. You should be this. You should do do that because it's available. And in a world where these tools are only a username and password away online, um, you know, creating a Facebook page takes time and it takes mm-hmm. a little bit of know how, but it takes no money in mm-hmm. comparison to back in the day when we were doing marketing and, you know, to like create a really well crafted press release or to um, do a, a TV or radio commercial or an ad in a magazine, you were really focused on that. There was a lot at stake money wise and, and attention wise. Nowadays, you know, people hit publish, like it's going out of style. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so they take comfort in knowing that there's somebody there that they, they built a relationship with that they can trust that says you should do this. And here's why. Here's why it applies to your company and your business or no, you shouldn't do this. And Mm -hmm. here's, and here's why, because they're very much caught up in a million tools and not knowing which ones they should use or a million channels and not knowing which ones they should use and why. And everybody talking about how trendy it is. Snapchat, for instance, right now, right? Snapchat's a great tool for for some people. And it takes a lot of creativity these days because it's not really um, built in a way to utilize uh, in say the same way that a paid, you know, social media channel might be or some advertising channel. It takes creativity. It takes somebody wanting to connect with the right audience and all that. So for certain customers, it makes sense. But is it something all of my customers have that extra time for if it even was appropriate for them? Not really. There's mm-hmm. so many other things ahead of it in mm-hmm. line that when that right customer of mine is 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 perfect for Snapchat, I will introduce them to it. Yeah. But but you've got people out there just talking about how cool Snapchat is in 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 fairly broad terms. Mm-hmm. And and it gets customers like mine and potentially yours going. I hear there's a lot going on with that. How, how should I be paying attention? And we got to sort of reel them in and go, let's step back and let's focus on your objectives and goals because that will help us select which of these t- channels and tools that we end up using. Let's not just think about using a tool because it's cool. Okay. Right. right. It used to be people would come and say, I have to have a Facebook. And you'd be like, okay, let's talk about what Facebook is. You know, but now it's really become even more confusing. And and Snapchat's a really great example because some of our really good friends and and huge consultants that are, you know, speaking on the stage all the time and and they're touting Snapchat, but then you go and look at their Snapchat channels and they're very personal. They're um they're not marketing their businesses as much as they are their personal brands, which is great. But does that really work for a lot of businesses, I don't think it does. Sure, the Discover Channel, the Food Network, I love their channels, but they have whole media groups behind them that are driving information. So, you know, it depends. And I think that's my answer to almost to that question every single time. Um, you know, they, every single time somebody asks me that question, is this network? good for me? The answer is it depends. And let's talk about it rather than, oh yeah, you got to be on, you know, whatever it is. And that answer of it depends always sounds like a cop out until you sort of go down the the line a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. because some folks like, oh, it depends really. It depends on, on, on what. And so it it feels at least to me, like when, if you just, that's all that comes out and you don't talk about it a little bit more, then it sounds like a cop out. And so it, it's it's an invitation to support that and to talk about why it depends. Um, mm-hmm. but, but it's totally true for every single situation, every business, even in the same space, in the same industry, businesses competing against each other, they're like fingerprints. They they are unique and they have different objectives and and making sure as a consultant, we have to be mindful of knowing our clients well enough that we are mindful of their particular needs and objectives and goals mm-hmm. uh, and also the sort of flavor and voice of who their brand is and so on. And there's a value 
and being able to have a long-term relationship with our clients to the point where we've invested so much time getting to know their business that they they want us there longer because we've become advocates. We've become an extension of their team. We've become somebody that's looking out for their best interest in whatever we end up doing, um, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think Megan has a nice point, too, that she finds there's a resistance to people wanting to hear about strategy. Lots of times they just want the magic tool. It'll raise them money or gain supporters. You know, everybody wants that magic button that a lot of people are saying is out there. But, you know, the magic button doesn't happen by itself. It takes work. It takes commitment. It takes actual thought about how we're going to pull that all together. If there was one place on earth that everything was perfect, we'd all move there. If there was one magic tool that we could use and all it took was throwing a couple dollars at it or whatever, then we would then we would use it. And that's the bottom line is is there are some channels where somebody has dug enough to do to put a formula together that works great for them and they've they've found you know ROI from mm-hmm. from it they found revenue whatever they 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 wanted from it um they've they 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 found um and then over time as that channel ends up getting saturated with others who have uncovered that secret as well or spread the word about that then then uh, it becomes less uh, less effective, and so um, you know, Facebook was was one of those places that early on, people who were doing Facebook advertising and trying to get people to sign up for uh, Farmville and all these other places, it was partially because nobody really hunkered down and doubled down on those channels with their dollars in mm-hmm. order to make that work. But now that other people are going, oh man, those guys had a lot of success, we should jump over there it's changed. It's evolved. If everybody's doing it, then if everything's important, nothing's important. If everything is, if everybody is putting their money on what's successful um, for the masses in, in, in a very vanilla term, it ends up actually becoming the opposite. It becomes more the noise than it does the, the, the signal, I think for, for a, a lot of folks. And so that's the, that's the issue is, People are, are too busy thinking, like you said, that there's just a silver bullet. They go to Walmart and they pick it off the shelf and 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 it's going to solve other problems. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Well, let's wrap this up Adam, with a question. And that is, what is a successful client relationship look like to you? What's your perfect client? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, five foot ten. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, I mean, I really, really love working with clients. Um, uh, what aisle are they in? <laughs> I really, I really, really love working with clients. Um, that it's hard because you know, there's, there's some of it has to do with like revenue and size of company and all this. Let's let's look let's look for my from a mindful let's talk approach, about the right? relationship that you have with the client. What so would the, what would a perfect client relationship look like? So the it's almost in a way that we acknowledge through our interactions that we're both human beings trying to work on the same team without necessarily mm-hmm. turning it into a, a gossip fest or something where we've got to go out and have um, um, you know, lunch together all the time and all that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm fine with doing that, but I'm just saying we acknowledge that we're both two humans working on the same team without necessarily, um, uh, with, without necessarily, um, what's the right way of saying it? Moving in together. <laughs> Moving into, yeah, we're, we're, we're not, there's no lack of professionalism, mm-hmm. but we, but we are recognizing that it's okay to be, to be human beings, to talk about, you know, hey, how's the weather? How's the kids doing? Whatever we've got on our mind at that moment, and then dive into the business and and to be frank with each other about what's you know about what's going on. Um, uh, I like clients that are willing to listen to the ideas uh, of of what's going on. So for us to anticipate some things and bring to them things that they might not likely have thought about or even potentially understand and be willing to go down the road of understanding so that they can decide if it's something they want us to act on. Because at that point it's based on trust, Mm -hmm. right? We have to very, very much 
um, convince and to sell th things sometimes. So we're in, 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 in our, we're in the position of having to sell the effectiveness of Facebook advertising or to sell the effectiveness of, of SEO. Like what, what needle is that going to impact? Mm -hmm. And clients won't always understand the whole picture. And so I have some clients that like, you have to like beat them over the head with the, with what the thing is for them to eventually buy in because as much as they don't understand and really it's a lot of times their lack of understanding i have to take responsibility for trying my best mm -hmm. to to explain and that's part of my job is to is to not have them have to come a step towards me when it comes to jargon or explaining uh or explaining how things work we need to meet in the we, we need to meet in the middle and i'm more than happy when it comes to explaining to those clients and to really helping them understand going three four five steps in their direction but if i do that and there's still this really big resistance then that 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 it's that's not gonna work it's not gonna work and, and so so for clients that that challenge me to communicate things in a way that is beneficial to business results OK, I, I love that because that's that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where I'm not just some guy that uses Facebook or, you know, mm -hmm. an iPhone that I'm I'm somebody that that actually is a digital marketer. You know, I'm somebody that deals with business strategy, not just a tinker and somebody who, you know, I'm not the guy that they got straight out of college. who They hired a millennial because the millennial knows how to use <laughs> Shout out to all the millennials over there. I'm just saying in general, you know, that folks say, let's hire the guy from at a high school that understands how to use Photoshop to design our website because he knows how to use Photoshop. Well, that right. guy doesn't understand how to use Photoshop to, to make what's going to be effective mm -hmm. to you, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you the long response. My clients <laughs> are somebody that is 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 willing to challenge me on on how to apply what I'm an expert at um, in whatever that means, um, mm -hmm. to, to their business. And then ultimately trusts me once we've had that conversation to implement that on their behalf without mm -hmm. having to basically write an entire book about what, what that means for them. Mm -hmm. Um, so somebody who's, who, who, who understands about building, you know, building trust and, 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 uh, and then letting me, letting me, do my job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll give my short answer to that same question. And I, I can distill it a little bit from what you said, because I know that we're pretty compatible in that regard. But for me, a perfect client is the one who comes really prepared, knowing what they want and is willing to trust me to help them get where they want to go. And, you know, that we're going to work collaboratively that it's really a collaborative thing to yes. make them successful and make us successful. And then we do all that together. And I didn't, I say that, didn't I say that <laughs> all those I things said, I was going to distill it. <laughs> it really, it really is, you know, that the clients that I get the most joy from, you know, when I see their number come up on my phone, I don't go, Oh God, I got to talk to them again. And they're not ready and they don't know what they're doing. And, you know, they, they want to fight about everything because they're not sure. And somebody told them that they had to have this particular app or that particular app. And now they're weather veining over there. I know it's really easy to get distracted and I don't mind talking them down off the ledge once in a while, but I also want them to trust me to know what is really going on out there and to work with them and, you know, know that I'm in it for them too, that I'm really vested in their success because that's something that's really important to me. I don't want to work with a client who, you know, I know is not going to succeed or doesn't want to succeed. That's not good for either of us. So, you know, if I feel that we're both in this game to win it, then yeah, that's, that's who I want to work with. Yeah. When and you know what success that's is, that's and who I do work with. when you ask them about six, what they're, you know, how do they measure success and they really understand you know, at least for, from their perspective, how they'll measure success. And it makes sense because we've mm -hmm. had conversations where uh, about, you know, how do you measure success? And they go, oh, well, this. And we go, okay, so what you mean is you want, you know, you want to increase your brand awareness. 
And they go, oh, no, 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 we want to do this and this and this. And go, but yeah, what you're saying is you want to increase brand awareness. Like you're not, you're not counting, you know, you're not measuring this by, by this, you're measuring it by this. And, and that's what it is. And if that person just doesn't understand how that mm-hmm. is, there might be a confusion, even if you write it down. There could yeah. be a confusion in the end when you go back and go, hey, guys, let's talk about whether we were successful with this or not. And that person looks and goes, no, we, we weren't. But you go, yeah, we were or vice versa, mm-hmm. depending on the, the way that person thinks, you know. So, yeah, I think collaboration is a big is a big yes w- with what you said. Um, definitely. Cool. Well, I could talk to you for a really long time and we've had some really long conversations, but I need to wrap this up. And so why don't you tell people, Adam, where to find you and uh, how best to connect with you? Um, Secret Sushi pretty much anywhere. So if you look at Adam Helway or Secret Sushi, you know, Secret Sushi on Twitter and, and a lot of other places, I'm more than happy to connect with people. Um, I don't know about you, Janet. I've not been using Twitter nearly as much, but I've got my account on there and I monitor it. I'd love to, but I have I have some fun engagement elsewhere. But uh, I've been jumping in there a bit more. So on Twitter and uh, on uh, you know other places, Secret Sushi or Adam Howey and SecretSushi.com. And the link to your website is on the screen right now. Yep, SecretSushi.com. I just really want to thank you, Adam. I think, you know, you have a really focused, very mindful approach to how you work with your clients. And I think, you know, this this was a really great conversation and, and I really appreciate your time. I would love to talk with you at any time, whether it's on the record or off record. You know that, Janet. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And thanks everybody for joining us. This was really fun. Next week, we've got Megan Keene, and we're going to talk about mindful community management. And I hope you're going to come back because I know that's going to be good.